Get a Legends, I hope that you're doing well. Now, I got something wrong yesterday. When talking about the Swiss president, I actually showed the wrong bloody guy. Now, the one I showed was from two years ago, so this is the one that I was meant to show you. Now, there are some very high expectations about upcoming offensives from both sides. And I found an opinion piece from a popular Ukrainian officer online that I think that you'll find interesting. Now, no matter what side of the fence you're on with this war, and wherever you see this war ending, there is a long, long way to go of any outcome. Now it says, Although my views may differ from those of government officials, I'd like to express some cautionary thoughts regarding the upcoming offensives. While I remain hopeful and committed to achieving victory, I believe it's important to temper our expectations and avoid the assumptions that the war will end quickly as a result of one counteroffensive, a realistic approach that takes into account the challenges that we might face. Even though Ukraine has received substantial support from the West, it's still only enough to sustain a few large offensives. Even if Ukraine successfully clears the entire southern region, it won't necessarily resolve the ongoing issues with Donbass or Crimea. The fall of one area doesn't guarantee the fall of another. It is important to recognize that the Russian forces are actively preparing for the upcoming counteroffensive, and we shouldn't underestimate their capabilities. Rather than making optimistic statements about how the war will end soon, it's more realistic to be prepared for a potentially prolonged conflict. We should also communicate this to our allies, so they can adjust their expectations and support accordingly. While I remain hopeful and committed to achieving victory, I believe it's important to temper our expectations and avoid the assumption that the war will end quickly as a result of this counteroffensive. Everyone in Ukraine is grateful for the support we receive from the West, including both governments and society, but I believe that we need much more to finish this war. This goes beyond just the provision of ammunition and military equipment, as important as those are. In addition to expanding training programs, we must prioritize efforts to improve our command and control structure. This includes sending our reserve officers to the best military schools to enhance their skills. We need to focus not just on improving the command abilities of NCOs and junior officers, but also those at the brigade level and above. I plan to release a breakdown of the analysis made by Lieutenant Colonel Glenn Grant in his article on the necessary changes for our army to remain modern and successful. Finally, I would rather hear that the war has ended sooner than expected, even if it means admitting that my previous predictions were incorrect, than to hear that my advice could have made a difference if only it had been heeded earlier. And I think that is very interesting what he says. Now, this video has been going around, but the time and location is unknown. But the way it's being reported is a volunteer soldier from New Zealand storms a Russian position and detains a man in a basement. After a few seconds, the detainee recognizes him and screams Nova New Zealand. It, apparently, it turns out it's a Ukrainian friend whom the Russians had held captive for months. Hands up! Give me your hands. Show me hands. Give me hands. Give me hands. Shut up. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. Oh, no Zealand. Oh, no Zealand. My brother. I know him, I know him. Oh, he was in the red house. Oh, <laughs> it's you. Good guy, good guy. No. Come with me. Oh. Now, there has been some movements on the map, and we will talk about that in a sec. But my question is, what's Qatar doing? <laughs> now, the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, or CIPRI, has released yesterday that Ukraine was the third largest importer of arms in 2022, as Western weapons have flowed into the country. But interestingly, topping the list was Qatar, a country with just under 2.7 million people, with the US having the majority of import into the Middle East, followed by France, but then Russia although Russia's export influence has been dropping over the past years. Also, Chinese leader Xi Jinping has a meeting with Putin in Moscow, potentially as early as next week. Now, it's being reported that following this meeting, then he plans to speak with Zelensky online. The Wall Street Journal has written, the first conversation between the Chinese and Ukrainian leaders since the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion is expected to occur online. 
Now, according to the Wall Street Journal, Xi's visit to Russia and potential talk with Zelensky reflect Beijing's desire to become more involved in mediating an end to Russia's war against Ukraine. Now, within the last month, Beijing has released a 12-point peace plan, which was heavily criticised when it failed to talk about the return of 2014 borders. Although we do know that US officials have expressed fears publicly about China supplying arms to Russia, and that China has not publicly denounced Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And China has accused the West of weaponizing sanctions. Now, what we do know is that if China get involved lethally, the international nature and effect of this conflict definitely steps up more than a notch. Now, onto the maps. My friend writes to me, Russian forces are trying to pincer up both Avdivka and Bakhmut in the north and south. And Avdivka is nearly under isolation like Bakhmut. So let's look at those areas. So as always on the map, we're on the deep state map. We have Ukraine, capital of Kiev, Romania, Poland, Belarus, and Russia around here. The red being uh, ground Russia has taken since 2022, and the maroony purple since 2014. And in here, we see Bakhmut, somewhere we are familiar with, that we've talked about a lot, and we will talk about uh, more movements in this area in a sec. And then just to the south, we have Avdivka. Now, Avdivka has a border down here, which is from 2014, which has not actually pushed across during this second invasion. And if we have a look on the ISW map, you'll see Bakhmut is telling a similar story here about that sort of isolation and potential pincer. But what is different in Avdivka is claimed Russian control beyond this black line here, which indicates where the Russian forces were from uh, the 2014 invasion and have moved across to the west almost into Avdivka. Now, this video is purportedly showing a Russian T-72 destroyed by Ukrainian forces in Avdivka from a trench system. Opa, 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 what's going on? Horrid! Horrid! Пидорский танчик. Герой в слава. Пидвилый пидор там валяется. Дохлый нахуй. Шлюха Банзе. My friend also says in Bakhmut, Russian forces are trying to push towards the canal in Orokovo Valaskivka and in the south, trying to outflank Ukrainian forces towards Stopochki. So let's have a look at these areas and what is happening. So the first time he talks about is Orokovo Valskivka, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing well wrong, but he's talking about these systems in here, these canals. So if we have a look on the satellite, maybe this will tell a better photo, these canals in here that Russia is pushing towards these and is trying to outflank on the south in the direction of Stopuchki, trying to outflank maybe a potential counteroffensive from the Ukrainians from, we know that there is a Western element here that could launch an attack. I've seen some videos recently of some other people that do similar to what I do online saying there hasn't been much change. And I doubt that because in Bakhmut, what we're seeing over the past 24 hours is this sort of southwestern pincer move up a long way. So if we look where it was yesterday on the 13th, today's the 14th of March, that the Russian forces have moved up into these blocks and are now very close to this main road. Now, as far as we're aware, this main road has been um, under fire for a long time now and has, is unable to work in some capacity. But what could be is these other roads in here and positions, we don't know their effect on this. And that gap is closing, or at least according to this. So if we look at that, we're talking, if we go the closest points, you know, 3.3 kilometers. So not very far at all. And if we look over the last couple of days, it is to a degree closing up. And we've also seen in the north, near where my friend was talking about Russia trying to take into these canals, we have seen a major movement over the past, you know, say 48 hours in that direction. So they've gone from just down this road to now ballooning out. And what does the ISW show in similar to that? If we move back up to Bakhmut, it's showing somewhat uh, that they're further down this road, I believe, or maybe very similar. So if we take where it turns right, then left. So the ISW is showing maybe more up into here, near Mankivka here, but it's showing the same sort of ballooning effect, at least under claimed control. Now, what we will do, as always, is compare the deep state map to the Rybar map. As we know, some of these have some different bits and pieces. So 
where we're looking is Bakhmut. And it is showing a very similar picture. And if we look where this sort of spur has come out over the past 24 hours onto this road, it is very similar on the Rybar map. And this sort of deep entrench where the Ukrainian forces are in here and almost getting a small pincer from here as well. But to the north, it is showing a similar picture as well, although it will show more ground taken up here on the Rybar map. But it is very interesting to look at both of these and compare them as we go, as these have been in the last months very, very similar. What other movements have we seen? We did see Russia to the west of Kremenar take some more ground in the past 48 hours, so there's a bit of balloon here, and then a little spire further out. As we know, these areas through here have been a massive front for both Ukraine and Russian offensives. And what about in Avdivka? Have we seen any major movements? So we're back on the 12th of March to the 13th. We've seen some small to the northeast and maybe just some small to the due north. But other than that, no other major moves on the maps. Now, both the US and UK have announced massive increases in their defense spending, with the UK announcing a $6 billion increase to replenish ammunition stocks, modernize nuclear capabilities, and fund the next phase of AUKUS submarines, which I'll talk about in a little bit in another video because that affects the Australian submarines. In the Reuters report, President Joe Biden had the biggest peacetime of US defense budget request of $886 billion. Now, this will also include a 5.2% pay rise for troops and the largest allocation on record for research and development. Now, with Russia's war in Ukraine spurring demand for more spending on munitions, the total amount for 2024 and the budget proposal of is $28 billion more than last year's $858 billion. Now, this comes after the Deputy U.S. Defense Secretary Kathleen Hicks said on Monday, Our greatest measure of success, and the one we use around here most often, is to make sure the PRC, the People's Republic of China, leadership wake up, wakes up every day considers the risks of aggression and concludes today is not the day. Now, that's all I've got for you guys today. I hope you're doing well and looking after yourself and I'll speak to you soon. So thank you very much. Bye-bye.